All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining our session today on the future of identity crime prevention. Uh, we've got a tremendous panel put together for you here today. Uh, joining me are Eva Velasquez, the president and CEO of the Identity Theft Resource Center. We've got Adam Kinder, the VBA incident team lead in the Benefits Delivery Protection and Remediation Division at the Veterans Administration. We've also got Phil Lamb, the Executive Director of Identity at the Government Services Administration. Uh, and I, my name is James Rotolo. I'm a Senior Manager at Grant Thornton uh, for Fraud Risk Mitigation. And uh, I'll be your host and your moderator for today's conversation about identity crime. Uh, and we purposefully picked the topic of identity crime, and that's a little bit different than identity theft. Um, so some people are familiar with identity theft or may have experienced some identity theft in their family. Uh, but what we're seeing is an increase in other types of identity crime, not just stealing uh, of uh, another individual's identity, but including the creation of synthetic identities and other types of related identity crime. So if you haven't heard that topic before around synthetic identities, that's when people take actual information from real individuals and combine it with some fictitious information to create a new synthetic entity that doesn't really exist. And so that can be very challenging when it comes to properly detecting identity and, and validating someone's information. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of that um, during the session today. And it's important to know that those types of synthetic entities uh, can include uh, companies and organizations, not just people. And so that presents a whole new set of challenges for people that are trying to detect fraud. Um, so what I've discovered sort of over the years in, in working in the anti-fraud business is the transactions themselves have become increasingly more secure. And so whether it's a credit card transaction or a login to a website or an app, uh, the actual transaction itself, the security uh, and the fraud detection technology has gotten quite good. And that means the fraud actors have basically moved upstream and started to commit these identity crimes, uh, account takeovers or creating these synthetic identities in order to commit fraud. So what, what I always like to say, I've got a friend in the industry who likes to use the term, the fraud issue has really moved from transaction to interaction. And so you know, that's a really different type of fraud challenge. And so identity has become a really important factor in, uh, in the fight against fraud. So uh, we've got a great group of panelists, I think with a diverse set of experience here that we're, uh, we're gonna get right into and, and jump into the detail now. Um, I'd like to start uh, with Eva. Eva, as I mentioned, is the president and CEO of the Identity Theft Resource Center. Uh, just a little disclaimer as we get started. In addition to my day job at Grant Thornton, I also serve on the board of directors of uh, the Identity Theft Resource Center. So Eva and I work together quite a bit. Um, so Eva, maybe you can share with the attendees a little bit about the ITRC and what it is that the organization does. Sure, and thank you, James. I'm really pleased to be here. Our, our mission is to empower and guide all stakeholders, victims, consumers, businesses, and government to minimize the risk and mitigate the impact of identity crimes and compromise. So what, what exactly does that mean? I mean, in other words, we help everybody with this issue. Um, and we do it through a variety of ways. Our, our contact center provides one-on-one -on -one assistance to about 10,000 individuals annually. We use a variety of platforms because we want people to engage with us in a manner that they're comfortable with. So they can um, call us at our toll-free number, live chat with us. They can use email, snail mail, social media, and then we have a free ID theft help app that was funded by the Department of Justice. And, and we inform about approximately 1 million individuals annually through our web-based services. But in addition to the victim services where we're providing that one-on-one -on -one help to people that actually need recovery services, or they just have questions. Um, we maintain a multi-year data breach report. It goes back to 2005. And we issue reports and look at the trends, and that's the compromise piece, because we're really trying to handle this holistically from both ends of the spectrum. Um, through activities just like this one, we try to educate all stakeholders on best practices for fraud, identity crimes, detection, reduction, and mitigation. And we serve as a relevant national resource on these issues. Um, and, it, and it's all encompassing, cybersecurity, data breaches, uh, fraud, scams, and then of course, the broad identity crimes. And we conduct research and surveys in collaboration with our, our partners and sponsors and um, under federal government grants, where we 
produce white papers and the survey results. And we really try to bring the victim voice to everything that we do. You know, when we look for solutions to this problem and have these conversations, I, I really do feel like it's my role and it's the role of the ITRC to remember as we're, however we categorize them, fraud rates, incidents, occurrences, there's a human being behind each of these rates, each of these incidents, and wh whose life has actually been negatively impacted. Um, so in other words, we try to humanize the data. That's great. And, you know, I'm passionate about the fact that you know, as, a, as a nonprofit organization, the center is able to provide services free of charge to victims of identity theft, right? People who often need it most uh, when their, uh, you know, their situation has become very challenging. So, uh, so that's exciting. And you mentioned research um, in your comments. So can you talk to us a little bit about uh, the research that you've seen and sort of how people that are victims of identity theft really are impacted. I know we, we talk a lot and hear a lot about the financial impact. Mm -hmm. That's not only the only impact, right? Exactly, and that's where I think we really set ourselves apart in a lot of our research. And we do quite a bit of it, but our aftermath survey is, we do this annually and it really is our flagship survey because it's so unique. We talk to the people who we've helped in the previous year. And we ask them a series of questions and we go much deeper than just how much time did you spend and how much money did you lose? Those are important, don't get me wrong. And I, and I think we still need to continue to have more research in that area because we have to look at the costs and how this is you know, impacting our economy on the whole. But we focus on the individuals. And in fact, I have a sneak peek for everyone that's listening right now because I have some trend data from our most recent aftermath. It hasn't even been released yet. We, we are right now in the analysis and looking at the key findings. But one of the things that we ask folks is what were the emotional impacts? How other than, you know, not just the money, but how did this actually impact your life? So I wanna share a couple of those statistics right now. 79% um, of our respondents actually said yes, there were emotional effects to being a victim of this crime. Frustration and annoyance, 68% of people said that that was something they experienced. I know that's no surprise, but it's something we think is important to categorize. 64% reported feeling vulnerable. 76% felt violated. 54% of our respondents felt helpless and powerless. 47% uh, felt a loss of trust. I don't think that's necessarily a surprise to anyone, but look at that language, how strong those emotions are and how high those rates are. And then the last one that I, I really do wanna focus on just a little bit, because we've seen an increase in, from, from last year. 10% of our respondents actually reported that they felt suicidal at one point. That is staggering. La the last time we did the survey, it was 7%. And that always takes people aback because they go, really, this is a f an economic crime. How can they have such strong reactions? But it, it really makes the point that what they are facing has so many tangential effects, these downstream effects on their lives, that it can lead someone to feel so hopeless that they can't get out of it, that they actually contemplate suicide. I'm not sure if anyone who's listening has even thought in those terms when you're thinking of identity crimes and identity theft, that it could have that powerful of an impact on people, but we have the research and the data to prove it and we talk to people every single day. So that to me is one of the most, the aftermath study is one of the most important ways that we can educate folks and let them know, this is a real problem. This is actually a crime. These are crime victims and many of their reactions are very similar to what violent crime victims report when they are surveyed after the fact. Yeah, and that, that was my thought, Eva, as you were kind of ticking those off was it sounds a lot more like the reactions you would expect people to have to a violent crime uh, than you would some type of economic crime. And so I think that is an eye opener for people. I don't think folks would be surprised that people are annoyed and, and irritated with the experience. I think if anybody's had to deal with it, it's it's very frustrating. Um, but, you know, it really has a lot of significant impacts on 
employment, on your ability to collect other types of benefits, and uh, lots of different aspects of your of your life, right? And so those are, those are major issues. Well, and if you think about how you use your own identity credentials and how you use them to move forward in your life, to pass a background check for a new job, maybe some of the folks here even had to pass security clearances, you know, to rent an apartment or purchase a home, to get a new vehicle loan. These are all things that you do to keep your, you know, your life moving forward and on track and things that an, an incident of identity theft can just stop cold. It just becomes this roadblock that people have to, you know, climb over just to do something to get their basic needs met, just to get housing. So, yeah, it really does have, they do have very similar um, emotions and uh, life impacts, lost opportunity costs just like violent crime victims. And how has the sort of the COVID-19 pandemic situation impacted what you're seeing? Have you seen an increase in these types of identity thefts, frauds, and, and maybe calls to your contact center? Well, of course, I think we all know that the fraud landscape has just, it's really blossomed. There are so many opportunities for the thieves, but the, the unique and interesting thing that we saw was on unemployment identity theft, we saw a 3,543%, and I did not misspeak, <laughs> uh, increase on this particular type of identity theft in our call center. Um, whereas in, in 2019, um, we would get maybe one, two, at the most three calls per month on this particular issue. It's been around for a long time. You can use those identity credentials to get unemployment benefits at the state level in someone else's name. But because of the pandemic and because of the additional funds that were put in, you know, into the unemployment system, it became very lucrative for the thieves. And because of all the past data compromises that we've had, they, they saw that as an opportunity to attack those antiquated systems and just brute force using the credentials that they already had, get those benefits. So we've handled, uh, we had 14 cases last year in 2019. And as of yesterday, um, we've handled 510 cases. And it's from, you know, all across the country. Um, it started in uh, Washington state. Really that was very early. It was, I think, May when that started. But we have heard from, victims in 43 of the 50 states and we are watching the trends as they go from state to state and unfortunately right now um, New Mexico and California are kind of tied that's where we're seeing the most cases come out of but I'm I'm also seeing Texas and New York sort of trend upward and I'm worried that those are where we're going to have the most cases as we come to the end of the year um, but that was one that we just, we didn't see that one coming. We knew all these other cases and, and types of incidents would increase, but the, the unemployment one really took us by, um, by surprise. And, and I don't think we are anywhere near the end of this. Yeah, I think, you know, we know from, uh, from history that fraud tends to increase in any type of recessionary economic environment, um, both because, you know, people are stressed for income and some people will turn to nefarious ways to obtain it. Uh, and certainly with the stimulus funding and, and some of those other programs, the money that's been made available through unemployment, through SBA, and, and uh, a lot of other topics on the agenda at this conference, I know talking about some of the work the inspectors general are doing and, and the challenges they have, uh, the PRAC and the oversight function that they serve, um, all seeing you know huge increases right now. So I guess that's, that's not a big surprise. Um, I'd like to pivot a little bit, maybe Adam, and, and turn to you and explore sort of what's happening within a specific agency. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you do at the VBA and sort of specifically what the Office of Financial Management Benefits Delivery Protection and Remediation Division does. And then we can sort of maybe get into the details of, uh, of what you're seeing from an identity crime standpoint. Yeah, thanks James, thanks for having us on. Uh, yeah, so from, uh, thanks um, from, Represent the Department of Veteran Affairs, Veterans Benefit Administration. Our office uh, is Office of Financial Management. Uh, our main role is to protect uh, veterans' benefits. Unfortunately, as Eva was mentioning, our veterans aren't um, immune to the, the threats that are out there as well. So we try to uh, protect the benefits program. Uh, we pay in the billions. Um, so we try to protect those benefits they've earned. 
prevent future cases from happening, and then try to make it a hostile uh, place for fraudsters to operate in. Um, and also spotlight and remove some of the waste and abuse that occurs. And then finally, just making sure that our agency is a, a steward of, of taxpayers' funds and then also veterans' benefits uh, that they've earned and, and deserved. Um, so we've really um, were established uh, around 2015 uh, when we started seeing um, a spike in online fraud. Uh, so essentially, we were stood up to identify that fraud as it occurs. Um, and then also take care of the veterans that are impacted. Um, as Eva was mentioning, unfortunately, on um, every single case that's impacted, you have a veteran that's out there that uh, in most cases relies on these funds to, to live off of. Um, so we try to minimize the impact. And um, one thing that we pride ourselves on is that we try to remediate cases within five days of knowing about them, um, just to minimize the impact to that veteran's life. Uh, and then also we try to investigate the case, try to figure out what, what happened, what, where we went wrong, put protections in place to stop it from happening. And then also work with our law enforcement partners to, uh, to forward those on so we can have successful prosecutions. And then finally, we try to put protections in play to uh, protect our veterans from future, uh, from future attacks and future um, things that are going on. So we try to learn from what we, what we know and maybe some vulnerabilities that we have at play. So on all, our, our main mission is to protect veterans' benefits. Um, and when it does happen, when there is a compromise, we try to minimize the impact to that veteran. And then we try to learn from our mistakes and build a, build a robust program that can essentially um, be stewards of taxpayers' funds. That's great. I mean, it's such a such an important mission, right? Um, to your point that there's so many people that are relying on these benefits to survive in, in many cases. And uh, those, you know, those benefits are a critical part of, uh, of their income. And uh, in many cases, I know you've got folks that are dealing with uh, with disabilities and you know, medical issues and things like that as well. Right. So there's a lot wrapped up in the benefits um, that are being managed here and, and a lot of risk. Um, so I, I'm curious to know, as uh, I think on the next slide, we've got some more detail about sort of the current capabilities that you've got and the focus areas for your team and, and kind of what you're working on. Can you share a little bit more about that with us? Yeah, um, pretty complex program. We, uh, just for frame of reference, we have about 20,000 direct deposit changes that happen per month. Uh, so in the scope of things, trying to identify how, which ones of those are fraud and which ones are legit. Um, than things around that nature. So we've partnered with uh, a few few agencies and a few uh, vendors that have helped us uh, use some of the uh, machine learning and automation to uh, give us predictions of what the uh, which ones would be more vulnerable. Um, so we're trying to lean lean um, automation and machine learning to get us in a, in a better uh, process assessment and basically give us data management to be able to maintain those um, those fraudulent changes that happen. And so based on those, we we try to feed the algorithm, learn from it. Um, the more we feed into it, the, be the better and smarter it learns. But also um, kind of going back to uh, individual veterans, we do have reports from veterans that will come in. And again, as the more and more we get of those, the more our machine learning learns from those and makes our system better. So relatively new to our operations, um, the machine learning and automation, but I will tell you that um, it, it seems to me, and, and based on this, what I've heard about this conference, that a lot of companies and agencies are going towards this. So I think it's it's needed um, from our standpoint, just based on the sheer volume, we needed to kind of get um, to a data analytics side and, and use some of that to our advantage. So our capabilities, like I said, uh, we've been utilizing some of the contracting and vendor capabilities to assist in there. Um, and then at the end of the day, they, they refer cases over to us that lo look suspicious. Um, in addition to that, we've partnered with law enforcement. Um, so the Department of Justice, uh, Office of Inspector General, um, to really partner with them to um, lean on the prosecution side of the house. So when we identify fraudsters and the schemes that come up, um, we realize that we as an agency um, aren't law enforcement, so we have to partner with them to get successful prosecutions. And I'm happy to report that we've uh, had quite a few in the upwards of 20 to 30 range. Uh, we've had successful prosecutions. And again, that ties back to having the data to be able to support that. Um, I myself have had uh, a couple occasions where I've been able to testify in court. And I will tell you that it's uh, very satisfying to um, you know, have someone that has defrauded our nation's heroes 
be held accountable and actually go to prison. And then also we're trying to integrate new data uh, streams as they come in. So um, as, as my peers on this council, uh, we're always trying to learn from our, our partners and, and what is going on in, in, in the fraud community, uh, fraud waste and abuse community. Uh, so I've highlighted a couple different uh, partners that we've looked at um, to try to give us data to, to continue to build on what we know of. Um, TransUnion is a good example of some of the credit uh, information um, and a few other agencies we try to, to partner with to um, you know, just give us more data to go off of. And then finally, we, um, we are one of many federal agencies, so we try to partner with our other sister and brother uh, agencies. Um, Social Security Administration is a good example for us because they pay benefits just as well as we do. Uh, so we do have a, a partnership with them where we try to collaborate and learn from each other. Um, and in fact, I'll, I'll share that uh, one of the things Social Security uh, does validation of account ownership and things of like that. So we kind of mirrored some of the things they were doing. And again, we try to share what we've learned uh, back with them. So again, I think one thing I would highlight here is the partnerships and uh, some of this conference, one of the main reasons why we want to participate is just the networking and, and learning from others and what they're doing. Um, so yeah, just uh, that's kind of where we've uh, learned from and then machine learning and automation is kind of where we're going to the next steps. That's great. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think, you know, as we were preparing for the session, uh, one of the things that I was most excited to hear about as somebody who's come from a of an analytics background, um, worked in the fraud analytics space for a long time, is you know great to see the organization embracing technology and machine learning and some of those advanced techniques. Um, I get the uh, the benefit of working with organizations both uh, within the government as well as within the private sector and kind of seeing all the different types of technology and capabilities that are available across uh, you know those different markets. And it seems like there is increasing amount of collaboration. And you've got more folks, even from the uh, from commercial business, that have maybe spearheaded some of the investment in these analytic techniques and technologies, supplying that and sharing that with government agencies now. And uh, you've got some examples of, you know, some data providers that are uh, operating in the commercial space here, which is great, um, but not without its challenges, right? The social security number when it was created was not really intended to be a unique identifier, right? And so. Um, and they have a lot of challenges, as, as you uh, as you mentioned, with their benefits programs as well. Probably very similar to, uh, to what you see. So great that uh, to see organizations that are willing to share and exchange ideas around that. So uh, so this is great. So maybe you can share with us um, how big a factor identity crime is in particular with the types of fraud cases that you see. And then I don't know if you have any case examples or uh, or samples that you could share with us. Yeah, sure. Happy to give a little peek under the hood. Um, it, one thing I will say that um, fraudsters are becoming more and more sophisticated. Um, at last count, I think we had about 20 uh, foreign um, influences that have been trying to target veterans benefits. So I will say like the account takeovers and um, the synthetic uh, takeover in account, uh, we have seen that. And a specific example that we've seen is um, on our online platform, uh, we have found that fraudsters have been able to compromise that and, and basically have access to a lot of information that is very personal to that veteran and, and basically can take over that, that account. Um, and we have seen in, in several cases where that's happened. Uh, fortunately, we put some security measures in play, uh, two-factor authentication, things along those nature that have stopped that but we have learned that uh, they are very sophisticated and they are trying to stay in front of us. Um, so we have put some protections in play and, and that's really dropped down. But I, I will say that um, based on those findings, we were able to catch um, some fraudsters and a couple different schemes I've highlighted on this slide. But another thing I wanna point out that as we tighten on the online security, um, we've had, we have a call center just like Eva um, and then also we have melon forms. And I, I will say, as we tighten up one area, the fraudsters tend to, to shift to other areas. So unfortunately, uh, as we tighten up one, um, recent examples, uh, we've started seeing just uh, fraudsters mail in uh, direct deposit change and, and sign in it like they are the veteran. Um, so although that's unfortunate, um, we're trying to catch it, but our procedures weren't necessarily ready for that. Uh, we've adapted quickly and, and making some changes to stop that from happening. But I just want to point out to, to the panel in this crowd that 
you know, it's kind of playing whack-a-mole. Um, one thing in the cat and mouse game with fraudsters is that you think you're in a pretty good spot until you're not. And and they have pointed out a lot of vulnerabilities that we try to try to play catch up on. Um, and our call centers, to the last example, I'll give uh, give in that we've seen where they've used synthetic voices, um, tried to impersonate the veteran, have the answers to all the questions their agents have, and have been able to bypass their security measures. So something we're challenge, uh, challenged with on a daily basis. And again, I feel like machine learning and some of the predictive analysis that we're doing will put us in a pretty good spot. But again, one of the things that um, I wanna highlight is that you know we can't do this our, ourselves. And so some of those partnerships are, are great um, and we need those. And so anyone, out there that's interested in, in partnering with our agency, we're happy to do that because, again, I think learning from others is the best approach and um, tighten it down. And I don't think anyone wants to see a veteran be defrauded. So, um, again, thanks for the thanks for the time today, and uh, happy to collaborate with anyone that, that's that's wanted or needed. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, I always like to say stopping this type of fraud is like squeezing a balloon, right? So as soon as you you tighten in one area, uh, you know, every all the fraud moves to another, and you know, we've seen this in banking, we see it in insurance, we see it at government agencies. As you tighten uh, the security technology in an online platform uh, so that the login is more secure, you know, they move to the call center channel, right? And they, they call in and you implement knowledge-based authentication and they get all the information from prior data breaches so they know all the background and how to answer the questions. And then you move to two-factor authentication and texting people passcodes and then they engage in SIM swapping attacks and actually get access to the phone and the device. And, and so they're, they're always looking to stay one step ahead. Uh, and that is uh, job security for us, perhaps, but, uh, but is one of the greatest challenges, right? So, uh, so that, that sounds very familiar. Um, all right, let's, um, let's move to Phil. Phil, um, I would say, you know, you've got perhaps the, uh, the coolest title of the panelists here today. Uh, so I'm interested to hear uh, from you about what it means to be the executive director of identity uh, at the GSA. <laughs> Thanks, James. Um, so, yes, I'm Phil. I'm the executive director of identity at GSA. Um, and specifically within GSA inside the technology transformation services. So uh, many of you all know GSA. We um, help manage a lot of contracts for the federal government help manage a lot of buildings um, for the federal government as well. But one thing that um, we also do, and this is the division I'm in, is help agencies um, transform their in-person processes online. How do we help them move towards more digital processing and servicing their, um, their constituents online? And what I do is I help lead the identity portfolio of that. So in, when I think about identity, I think about citizen-facing identity and businesses, um, not really the, um, the federal employee and contractor side. So um, that's, that's kind of what my, my day job is. Um, but the most fun part of my job is kind of thinking through some of these larger challenges that you know, Eva was bringing up and, and Adam is working through, is I see identity as just this foundational component that can really help much bigger use cases. And I think identity theft and preventing identity crime um, is one of those big ones. Um, I know what when we think about identity and helping with identity theft and crime is, can we help um, protect the identity in the, on the front end? Because when I think about crime, I think about, hey, something bad happened to me. Someone took over my identity. And now I'm calling Eva's help desk so that her, her folks can help me resolve it. It always seems to be retroactive. So is there a way that we can put some controls on the front end to prevent the fraudster from even taking over my account, from even you know um, grabbing my kids' SSN and putting their name on top of it, that synthetic problem, James, that you were talking about? So um, one suite of services that we provide is GSA. It's called login.gov. Um, it is a multi-factor authentication credential that any agency can use. And uh, this past year, we launched an identity verification capability as well with it. So what that does is before you, let's say, apply for a benefit, um, you can go through this identity verification step so that a fraudster can't assert that they are you. Um, prevents imposters in a way we think it's effective, um, but it's also 
you know, easy enough to use so that a good person can get through it. So we're hopeful to see more adoption of that as we go through and hopefully that can help with um, the challenges you're seeing, um, Eva and, and also, you know, Adam. Yeah, and, and one of the things you mentioned uh, kind of triggered a thought uh, for me, which is it's that constant balance between security and, you know, low friction experience for mm -hmm. the legitimate uh, consumers or uh, or citizens. And so, you know, how, what have you seen in terms of the trends? Uh, yeah. Fraud is increasing or identity crime is increasing and you have to implement detection technologies or security technologies, but don't want yeah. to make it so cumbersome that you can't use the service. That's right. Well, Eva gave us a sneak peek on trends, um, but but absolutely, as, as more online services um, get onboarded, as we have national emergencies like we've just seen, and you know, a, a massive surplus of benefits get delivered via online capabilities, we're seeing fraud ramp up with it. And so what, what the trend is that I'm seeing um, from a federal agency perspective is a greater focus on identity greater focus on identity solutions that can help protect against that. Um, and I think that's all that's all good um, for us to do. The other trend I see too is uh, there's a broader recognition that just asking for somebody's date of birth or social isn't going to cut it anymore. Um, I think five, ten years ago, the state of the art in the industry was knowledge-based questions. But we all know that that's that's not it's not good enough anymore. Everyone has our information. So what's that next thing? Uh, the next thing that we're thinking about um, from a GSA side is, hey, can you take a picture of a license? Can you take a selfie? Can you match those things? Can our algorithm match those things? So I have a, I have a better idea that you, know, you really are who you say you are. And so we're piloting this effort um, and we think that that could be a really great way to prevent things like synthetic identity fraud and theft um, so that you know you really do have a way to stop imposters from impersonating it. Yeah, that's great. I think um, you know it's interesting to hear Adam talk about uh, what's basically a form of deep fake technology right with audio and impersonating people's voices and we see that uh, with video now as well in some yeah. cases and so what are what are some of the biggest challenges you're seeing in order to be effective at detecting or preventing this type of fraud? Well, uh, I mean, it is whack-a-mole. It is the balloon squeezing. Yeah. Um, but I think we shouldn't be disheartened because as, as fraudsters innovate, there are vendors innovating as well in the space. And whether it's device authentication, um, understanding where you're coming from online, if you're coming through a VPN, through multiple proxies, and then it ends up being in you know a nation state um, that we know that's the, that, that's committing fraud against us. Those are those are signals that our vendors can provide us now, so that we can make appropriate steps towards that, right? Or it's okay. James is giving me a call. We're doing some sort of text to his mobile device, and we know the mobile device is in possession of James. We know generally the geo is where you normally authenticate in, we feel better about that. So, so I do think there are capabilities as well from the vendor space that we love to take advantage of. And, you know, honestly, if those are um, listening, we'd like to hear more about um, to help prevent that. Um, and I think as we add additional layers of security for this, what we hope is that we make it a little, little harder and a little cost prohibitive, right? Because from a fraudster perspective, they just want to make some money. So if we make it a little bit harder, um, that the cost, the benefit isn't there for them anymore. Uh, I think that's what we hope to achieve. We'll never get to 100%, but let's let's deter as many as possible. Yeah, spot on. And um, you know, most organizations that I talk to look at that defense in depth, you know, concept of having multiple layers, right? And and it's that constant balance between low friction experience and and uh, and providing the security protections, but that's just really the game that we play and, and we're going to continue to do that uh, going yeah. forward. But um, I, we've talked a little bit about synthetic identity. I don't know that everybody in the audience knows exactly what that is or how that occurs. Would you be able to share a little bit more about that? Sure. So, so when, um, when we were first thinking about synthetic identities, what 
what happened, and this was maybe a few years ago, was that um, someone would take a social security number. Um, it's a valid social security number. They would just add their name to it. And um, a few years ago, this would pass a credit check perhaps because they would just perhaps check that the social security number is valid and that social security number doesn't belong to a deceased person. Um, I think, you know, the credit bureaus have innovated beyond that so that, you know, it's not just that you have to attach, you know, the name to it as well. Um, so we were seeing fraud where someone would take a child's social security number um, they're not deceased, but they add their name onto it, open credit cards, et cetera. Um, so that's the idea of synthetic identity. They're adding real identity pieces together um, into this digital persona that doesn't really exist. And something that um, we've been thinking through and was recently um, in 2019, OMB published a new memo, um, it's called 1917, that says, look, federal agencies, you are authoritative on identity attributes. You as Social Security, Social Security Administration are authoritative on SSN. We should be able to connect with you and the citizens should connect with you to be able to validate that information at the root of trust. And Social Security has done a lot of work in this um, and they've been really spearheading it, which is fantastic. That could really eliminate synthetic identities. And something that my office is doing is working with other federal agencies that are authoritative on data, um, such as address or your passport number or, um, you know, uh, other things so that we can develop a system where, you know, you could actually ask, for example, the post office, hey, does James live there? And they can respond back, yes or no. We can talk to perhaps the State Department and say, hey, is this passport legitimate? And they can say yes or no. That is something that actually doesn't exist today, which may be surprising for some folks. Um, but that memo that OMB issued allowed the agencies to be able to say, okay, this is now a permissible use. It's never a technology problem. API has been around for a long time. But this is a permissible use now because OMB said it was okay. And so we're, we're hopeful to work with them to think through what those pilots could look like. A lot of it's on the policy side of it. A lot of it's um, thinking through consent and making sure that the customer is aware of how their information is being sent. But with, with those tie-ins to authoritative sources, I think that's how we're gonna really tackle like, synthetic identity theft and fraud um, so that at least we've not whacked that mole. Yeah. yeah, that's great to hear. I'm, I'm very excited about that. I, I know in uh, the work that I do with uh, with banks, um, you know, we have a lot of challenges with synthetic identity and uh, with children often being the targets to your point. And right. we have a tradition here in the United States to get socials uh, issued to our children as soon as they're born, usually. Uh, and that's often to get your insurance benefits and the other things that sort of social security numbers often use for. Um, and you know, they typically don't use that social in the credit system for 16, 18 years, right, until they go to get their first credit card maybe when they're in college. And so um, so there's this big window of time, right, when that social can be exploited and used for synthetic identity fraud. And uh, and we've seen that quite a bit in, uh, in the banking industry, and we see it with uh, the work we do with government agencies as well. And the, uh, the bad guys are really clever in their approaches, right? And we've seen those situations where they'll apply for credit, they'll get denied uh, because that entity doesn't exist in the database. But now that they've applied, that record was created. So when they apply a second time, the credit bureau says, well, you don't have good credit, but we've seen you before, right? So you, you have some credibility. And uh, over time, you know, they get secured cards, they build up a credit profile. Uh, one of the, the really popular scams now um, is piggybacking on people who have legitimate credit and asking to be added as an authorized user to their account. And so wow. I've even seen scenarios where, um, you know, you all may have seen um, articles suggesting this is a way for you to make money on the side is selling your authorized user slots on your good credit accounts. And, you know, while technically not illegal, um, it, it's obviously not a good idea to give people access to your credit. And the bad guys uh, are doing this and they're, they're actually running up the credit and paying it off. And so it's actually benefiting your credit profile. The reason they do that is because they are radically increasing their credit an association as an authorized user on your legitimate account. And so with that new synthetic identity. And so and once they, they bust up, out, 
Later. And then they get their own cards yeah. and they bust wow. out, right? And 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 you know what? One of the other sort of really interesting um, recent scenarios I've seen is the banks are putting in fraud and identity protections for clients. And so if your identity is stolen and you call your bank and tell them that somebody stole my cards or my identity, no problem, Mr. Customer. We'll refund the money. We'll make sure that you know you're good to go. Uh, the synthetic guys are calling up and saying my identity was stolen after the bust out and getting their credit replaced and getting their money back and then busting out a second time right because they they've created the identity they can answer all the knowledge based questions they have the cell phone that's tied to the account they can do the multi factor authentication for that synthetic identity because they created it so wow. a lot of you know incredible challenges i'm sure things that, that some of these things that you guys see as well um, and to me, this is why it's one of the most exciting sort of spaces as it relates to fraud detection, fraud investigation, is because identity has become so critical to every type of transaction that we do, whether it's government benefits, insurance, banking, right? All these programs really rely on properly identifying somebody's identity. So, uh, so fascinating space. I do want to uh, spend a couple minutes and see if we can grab some questions from the audience. Uh, if you haven't submitted anything yet, there is a Q&A panel. You can go ahead and enter a question, or if you see one uh, that you like, you can upvote it and make sure that it gets a little bit more attention here. We have a ton of questions in the queue already, so I'll go ahead and grab some. Um, seems like everybody's very interested in the topic. Uh, let me just scroll through here and see if we can find a good one. Um, let's see. We talked about some of these already, actually, so that's great. Um, so maybe a question for you, uh, Phil, about why you think the uh, the government hasn't made it a felony uh, to steal someone's identity. In most cases, it's a simple white collar crime. Do you have a perspective on on that? Maybe your uh, policy comment. I can't comment on behalf of the government on that topic, but um, I, I think I think as as Eva mentioned before, um, that there is an emotional analog to identity theft, to something like a like a violent crime. And I think as more statistics around that show up, um, it really justifies, you know, potentially looking at it much more seriously. You know, I one of my family members was a victim of identity theft. Um, absolutely, it was a massive, um, you know, uh, impact on us as a family, you know, and uh, it's 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 such a challenging thing. I think it's it's worth looking at, um, but unfortunately, I, yeah. No, I it's great. I, thank you for the perspective. I mean, Eva, uh, what are your thoughts? I know, obviously, you spent a lot of time. Talking I to can comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there, there's two pieces here. First of all, yes, I do think it would be more than appropriate to have more of these crimes categorized as a felony, so that we have more severe consequences. However. That's actually not where we feel we need to start. Um, you know, if we would at least prosecute some of the misdemeanors, that that would help. Um, right now, we, because of resources and because of this sort of, this cultural mindset that we have that this just isn't a big deal, um, we aren't even investigating and prosecuting those cases. Misdemeanors have some teeth. Yeah, they don't have prison time, but they do have jail time and disgorgement of the profits and restitution that they have to pay back for the victims. So a great place for us to start. If we aren't ready to sink our teeth into those, the policy questions and getting better, you know, changing the laws and getting the legislation passed, we are advocating for please just use the laws that are already on the books. They exist. We need more resources for these investigations to occur um, with these lower level, I hate to use that, that's a powerful word right there that I'm using, but with these crimes that maybe don't rise to the dollar amount that would get federal organizations involved, not these massive fraud rings, but these smaller incidents, these smaller rings, these individual people, if we went after them with the misdemeanor laws that are already on the books and started doing that in a systematic way, we would have a reduction because right now they know exactly what the threshold is to stay under the radar and to have law enforcement, especially local law enforcement, just say, here's your report to prove that you're a crime victim, but we aren't going to conduct any level of investigation. 
Yeah, and, and unfortunately, the reality is, you know, for some of these uh, organized crime rings, while the, the fraud that they perpetrate is quite large, right, could be millions of dollars in this unemployment fraud example that we were talking about earlier. The reality is the impact to, you know, a single case, a single person, a single identity theft is relatively small. And so, you know, that's the that one person's battle, right, doesn't get nearly as much attention, unfortunately, in, in most cases. And there are a whole host of jurisdictional issues. In many cases, the perpetrators are outside the United States and operating right. remotely. And, and there's a lot of complications there. So um, but just just so you're aware, I do want to make this clear to the to the listeners who are thinking that, well, a lot of times they just can't they can't get the bad guy because he's not here. I can I promise that we are talking to people every single day who themselves have enough information because of the way the crime was perpetrated, they actually know where the thief is. They know what address their mail was um, subverted to. They know they they have information that if they if law enforcement were to step in, they actually could go get them. They're in this country, they're known or could actually be discovered quite easily. And it and it's not always a jurisdictional, um, they're, you know, they're in a country we can't extradite from and the fraud isn't that big. That, I think that's something we tell ourselves so that we're a little more comfortable with not prosecuting or, or investigating these cases. But it's not the reality with every single case. There are a, there's a lot that we could do that would make an impact. I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> it's a shame you're not passionate about the topic even. I know. Uh, no, thank you for sharing that. And um, let's go um, over to Adam. Let me let me ask you a question about um, our attendees are asking about some of the technology that you mentioned. Um, in particular, if there are certain types of machine learning methods or tools or there, uh, I know you referenced some of the data sources, but are there any particular um, components that you can share with folks that have been most impactful for uh, for your organization? Yeah, um, one thing that's been key for us is just uh, correlating, I think, uh, as Phil stated, like correlating data. So working with our friends over at Treasury, like if, if they know someone owns an account and it's valid, like we can ping off that and know if it is legit or not. Also integrating IP addresses, telephone numbers, addresses, all the data sources we can get to kind of put the piece of puzzle together. And then a lot for us is the timing of the change. Um, our benefits are paid monthly and so, if it's made right around that time of the month, then usually we'll risk score those a little bit higher. So putting all those pieces together um, and, and feeding our algorithm to get smarter over time on known fraud cases has really been key to our success and trying to identify the fraud before it occurs is our end goal. Um, and I'll just say the more data you can get in, fed in there, the better off you're gonna be. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, I see in many cases the sort of pivotal functionality that people need in any of these machine learning programs is really feeding it the right data, right, is critical. Garbage in, garbage out kind of concept, right? You want to make sure you get the best stuff in up front so that the, the models can learn, regardless of the type of modeling tool or technology that you're using. So uh, increasingly, that means sourcing information from a bunch of different places both within your own organization as well as collaborating with others outside that may have some useful uh, data that, that, that can benefit those models. So uh, so thanks for that. All right, well, we're, uh, we're about out of time. I will uh, quickly ask each of you if you have uh, one sort of final piece of advice or words of wisdom to share uh, with the attendees, what's the one thing that you would like them to know about protecting their own identity? Um, Eva, let's start with you. I would just say, folks that are listening, remember this is a shared responsibility and all of the things that you're learning in your professional life at these conferences, please share them with your network um, because that's it's going to take all of us sharing this information with everyone so that we can all have an impact. Great. Adam, how about you? Yeah, the one thing I just want to share is, you know, I have this conversation with veterans daily um, I, I think my advice would be, and, and I get to tell this to them as well, is, you know, if, if we send notifications or reach out or um, you get notifications that a, a account has been compromised, take prop, prompt action to do your deal, due diligence and report that uh, to the agency that you didn't make the change. That way we can, um, you know, promptly address it. I've seen a lot of occasions where that doesn't happen and it just compounds the issue. So just take prompt action once you're aware of a compromise. 
Thanks, Adam. Phil? Enable MFA everywhere. As a person, individual, I know it's annoying. Do it. Um, set up the backup codes, et cetera. That's something that's going to protect you. Trust me, it's not worth um, something um, you know happening to your accounts. If you're in a position where you can actually force MFA for your users, um, strongly consider it. Although it's a hindrance, it's a speed bump, it's going to be worth it to your program and to protect your, your, your system's data. So you heard it from the experts, you know, work and share information and collaborate with your network, take prompt action to address any issues that happen and turn on your multi-factor authentication wherever you can. Uh, I wanna thank Eva, Adam and Phil for their time. I thought it was a great session. Uh, if the number of questions that have come in the Q&A panel or any indication, uh, the audience enjoyed it as well. So uh, I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. Thank you.